Welcome you all. My name is Lolita Devine. I'm the producer of The Real Talk Show and also a media correspondent at touchfm.org. Uh, I am here just to be the master of ceremony. I thank uh, Claudette, Miss Petra Destiny, uh, for inviting me to do this job. It's very important that um, we learn more about Common Core. Um, so we have an expert here who I've been uh, able to see on YouTube. It's so honored to be able to meet you in person here today to learn what are the what are the pros and cons, if there are any pros at all, of Commerce Core. So thank you all for being here. We're going to first come call the person that's going to do the welcome address. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, think yeah. <laughs> I shouldn't have my card here. That's However, right. um, my brother, come right up and welcome us. All right. Well, thank you very much. Thanks for coming out. And uh, thanks for those who have showed up. I just before I introduce Duke, I just want to do a few things. This is being sponsored in part by Camp Constitution. I happen to be the camp director, and I want to mention we have a sign-up sheet here. If you do not, if we do not have you on our contact list, and if you'd like to be contacted, just uh, avail yourself uh, of that. Just perfectly an email address that's legible. <laughs> See. And I want to mention that we have a wonderful week, week and a day long family camp in Ridge, New Hampshire. You see the poster in the front here. Uh, next year's camp, July 2nd to the 9th, which means July 4th. And we have some very exciting things going on. July, we're planned July 4th. On the back are some complimentary items. Of course, we can't be a camp constitution without offering constitution. So please, if you don't have one, and if you do have one, take an extra one. What do you do with it? You give it to somebody who doesn't have one, right? And I want to mention, too, that uh, at the passing of Sam Blumenfeld, a pioneer in the homeschool movement, Sam uh, willed his library to me, and we actually took possession of it before his passing, and we created the Sam Blumenfeld archives on the Camp Constitution site. We're getting about 175,000 views a month in the last couple of, just in the last few months. And we're not like we have a big budget to promote it either. Uh, some wonderful resources. If you're a homeschooler, if you want to teach your children or even teach yourself how to read phonetically, you can do that on our website. We have all 128 lessons in audio and video of Sam's uh, <coughs> Alpha Phonics. Also, if you want to learn how to do cursive, we have a cursive instruction on this website, mm -hmm. as well as uh, real arithmetic, none of this common core nonsense. As well as that you have Sam, we have about 150 audio speeches of Sam. There was, before Common Core, Sam was exposing this stuff back in the 60s and 70s. Uh, so avail yourself of that right on the campconstitution.net site. And uh, Duke Pesta authored an article in the New American Magazine back in April. So please, we have about uh, a half a dozen or so. We also have some, the Sam Blumenfeld newsletter. Uh, so please take a, avail yourself of those resources. Well, I'm very honored, Dr. Duke Pesta. This is about his 18th presentation in the New England and New York area, first time in the confines of Boston, I believe, because of Dedham, we were Dedham last, uh, last year, just on the outskirts. Dr. Pesta is the, uh, he is a professor of English literature, a Shakespearean, uh, at the University of uh, Wisconsin, Oshkosh. He is also the academic director of the Freedom Project Education. And by the way, we do have information about that entity. It's a K-12 degrees granting entity online. And right now you get about 600 students, I guess, and uh, even a few from other parts of the world. 12 countries. 12 countries, phenomenal. And uh, he started doing these presentations just almost by accident. It wasn't like, we're going to go out, I'm going to do 500 presentations in 46 states in the next three years, right? <laughs> but he's traveled all over the country. The four states he hasn't done it yet, Alaska, Hawaii. He says Hawaii would be good in January, is what he says. Yeah. <laughs> but we in New Englanders, we haven't got anything in Vermont and Rhode Island, so we're going to have to work on that because we, we have to be a New England pride thing, you know. So we've got to get them in those two states this next trip up, hopefully, at least Rhode Island. And he's testified at hearings and spoken to state legislators and even had press conferences at state houses like Maine and New Hampshire. So uh, let's give him a nice warm uh, Boston hand. Uh, we have one more announcement here. Yes, we do. Um, Hal, thank you so much. We want to, before we start this night, we would like um, Ms. Petra to come up and oh, do yes. a short prayer. Please. Yes. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Very important. Uh, okay. Um, I just want to say thank you for coming out, okay? And I just want to pray 
just very, very briefly and we pray the Lord will give us the wisdom that we need in order to do what we have to do because this is something that's very important and we have to get into our the states. And so, Lord, we're asking you to guide us, give us wisdom, help us to be understanding, to know everything that you want us to know, to speak what you say to say, Lord God. Not our words, Lord God, but your words be done, Lord God. Your will be done in earth as it already is in heaven, Lord God. You know what you want for our children. Our children need to be able to learn and learn correctly so that they'll be able to do what they need to do for your kingdom, Lord God, and for your glory, Lord God. So we ask you, Lord God, to give Duke the wisdom that he needs, Lord God, in order to get this information out, not just to us, but to everybody throughout the state. And our Lord, we're asking for the Holy Spirit to bring people in, Lord God, so that they can hear what is needed to be said. Father, so we thank you, we give you praise, glory, and honor, and we thank you and we bless each and every one for coming out. May you bless them and keep them. May you cause your face to shine upon them and be gracious unto them and give them the peace. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right, thank you all very much. And thank you, Miss Petra. That was beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so what I'd like to do is um, really just get out, in the line, get, get out there what Common Core is. Um, and you know, the way we begin, we've got, uh, many of you probably, if you know anything about Common Core, you know about the testing. These meaningless high stakes tests, these highly complicated, completely irrelevant, don't help teachers at all tests. For a long time, Massachusetts, you were in the PARC, P-A-R-C-C, -C, testing co uh, consortium. Big corporate testing consortium, not the least bit interested in your kids' education, interested in gathering data on your kids through the tests. Well, uh, through the good work of a number of different organizations here in this room today, Fighting Park, the state of Massachusetts now has technically gotten out of Park, but only to replace it with MCAS 2.0, which is a different testing system that does exactly what Park did. In other words, the government of Massachusetts is trying to bait and switch you. Moms and dads across the state dislike the testing so much, they just, they pulled out of it, but then they replaced it with something just as bad. So don't let yourself be snowed by that. Uh, you really want to be on the lookout for MCAS 2.0. It is Common Core, it is Common Core aligned. It's just the same devil with a different name. So we want to make sure we do that. You're going to see before we're done today uh, why this matters and why testing is at the core of it. So let's begin quickly. You all may remember Jonathan Gruber. Mm -hmm. He is one of the a Massachusetts person, right? From your, you're from New England. A, uh, a consultant on the health care legislation, the national health care law. And Mr. Gruber, after Obamacare, for lack of a better word, was put in place, uh, after $6 million the, the federal government paid him to consult about this. Here's his view about it after it was all said and done. You know, law which said healthy people are going to pay in, it made explicit that healthy people pay in and sick people get money, it would not have passed. Okay, just like the people, transparent, lack of transparency is a huge political advantage. And basically, you know, call it the stupidity of the American voter or whatever. But basically, that was really, really critical to get anything to pass. Lack of transparency is a huge political advantage. If we had told the taxpayers what was in the health care law, you wouldn't have wanted it. That's why they didn't let you vote. They didn't. Remember Nancy Pelosi? You've got to pass the bill before we let you see what's in it. And this is how government works. There's a, there are tremendous parallels in Common Core and the health care law. They are both federal takeovers of things that the federal government should not be in control of. They are both highly bureaucratized, highly politicized. We know, right, that the purpose of the health care law is not to make medicine better. It's to level it off. It's to centralize it. It's not going to improve the quality of medicine. It's going to politicize it. Common Core does all the same things to education. And I would argue that as bad as the health care law is, I mean, and even progressive liberal Democrats are pointing out now that the thing is a failure. As bad as the health care law is, what happens to our kids in, in, in elementary and middle and high school is much more serious. As adults, we can figure out ways around health care. We can figure out ways to try to cope with this. But when you're exposing five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten-year-old children to really radical ideology, uh, there's no way you're going to be able to unmake that. And so it's a big, complicated deal. And I will say that compared to the health care law, Common Core was much, much less transparent. I mean, as bad as the health care law is, there was a hearing in the House and the Senate. C-SPAN did shows on it, right? The Supreme Court had some uh, judgments to make about Obamacare. None of that happened with Common Core. Common Core, the way we educate our children, 
Uh, moms and dads were not consulted. Mothers and fathers, the primary stakeholders in public education, the people whose real estate property taxes pay for the schools, they weren't consulted by this. Uh, the education system in this country was completely transformed without any teacher cooperation, without any mom and dad cooperation, without any local government cooperation, without even the states cooperating. This was done behind the scenes. It's a very dangerous thing. So in order to understand Common Core, for moms and dads who, who don't pay much attention to education, who have not uh, understood the origins of it, there's a reason the founding fathers of the United States, there's a reason that the Constitution makes no provision for public schools. Because the, uh, the, the founders who ran away from tyranny, ran away from oppression, uh, from the British Empire, they recognize that if the government's primarily in charge of schooling kids, the government will inevitably come to educate kids for their benefits. That the children will become uh, educated by the state to serve the needs of the state and not the needs of the local religious traditions, not the needs of, of your faith or your community or your local government. And that's what's happened here. But people don't recognize that there was no public schooling in this country until about 1850. 1850 is when we got the first public schools. And the man who created them is a fellow by the name of Horace Mann. Now you can go to every state in this union, almost every county in this union, and you'll find a statue or a school named after him. Right? Horace Mann School, Horace Mann this and that. But what people don't realize is when Horace Mann created American public schools, he did it not to educate but to control. Horace Mann, the father of modern public schooling, he looked around the world to find a model for American public schools and the model he chose was the authoritarian Prussian model. You may remember Prussia, right? Germany, uh, a segment of Germany in the 19th century. Think of Otto von Bismarck, very militaristic. This was, this was the precursor of the Nazis, right? And you remember what the Nazis did with school. The Nazis took kids from their parents at very young ages, put them into school, uh, public boarding schools, and were indoctrinating kids to serve the state. At one point in Nazi Germany, you had the Hitler Jugend, the Hitler Youth, they were called. Children who had been educated not by their parents, not by the Christian tradition of Germany, but by the government. And they were actually informing the government about things their parents said that went against Nazi propaganda, having their own parents arrested. The model for the American public school system was the Prussian model, which did exactly that as well. Here's a quote from Horace Mann about the purpose of modern public schools. After a child had arrived, has arrived at the legal age for attending school, whether child of noble or peasant, the only two absolute grounds of exemption from attendance are sickness and death. We who are engaged in the sacred cause of education, we are entitled to look upon all parents as having given hostages to our cause. In 1850, Horace Mann argued that your kids belong to government schools now. Your kids, America, belong, they're hostages to our cause in government. The second most important figure in the history of, of American public schools is John Dewey. John Dewey was a Marxist communist philosopher. Uh, he is a very famous figure in the origins and the evolution of American education. John Dewey took over when Horace Mann died and push the ideology of, of, of modern public schools. Here's a quote from Mr. Dewey. Children who know how to think for themselves spoil the harmony of the collective society that is coming, where everyone will be interdependent. Right? For John Dewey, for, for Horace Mann, schooling, public schools, were an opportunity to change the way American children think, to separate them from their parents to have the federal government become the surrogate parents in lieu of moms and dads. John Dewey points out that the purpose of education is not to get things, kids to think critically. We don't want kids to think independently and critically. We want things, kids to conform. We want to use schools to make kids conform to what government wants them to believe. And it gets better, right? Uh, John Dunphy, the disciple of John Dewey, very influential humanist who had a huge influence on modern American public schools. He said this as recently as 1983. I am convinced that the battle for humankind's future must be waged and won in the public school classroom by teachers who correctly perceive their role as proselytizers of a new faith. The classroom must and will become an arena of conflict between the old and the new, the rotting corpse of Christianity 
together with all its adjacent evils and misery, and the new faith in humanism, resplendent with the promise of a world in which the never-realized Christian ideal of love thy neighbor will finally be achieved. We are going to destroy faith, we are going to destroy family, and we are going to reinstitute a secular progressive utopia. And by the way, uh, just while we're on this topic, uh, speaking of the Nazis for a moment, the first three things the Nazis did when they took power, the first three things, they banned all guns, except for the government, they, pr they insisted upon socialized medicine, national health care, because they then controlled the doctors, and three, they banned all schooling except public schooling. No homeschooling, no Christian schooling, no uh, Jewish schools, just government schools. Those were the first three things we did. How many, already in this country, you're getting close to two of them, right? Keep it in mind, because the purpose here, and by the way, I, I want to emphasize from the beginning, Common Core is not a Democrat or a Republican problem. Now, this transcends political party. It, it transcends gender and race and religion. What this, it's not the Dems versus the Republicans. This, I define this as the Washington Beltway elite versus you and me. The, and that's both parties, right? People who think they know better than you do. People who think they have the right of the federal government to tell you how you live, what you eat, where you will go, what you will say, how you will worship, and most importantly, what your kids are gonna know about the future. It's a very dangerous time. And look, if you look around what the federal government's doing, it's centralizing everything. It's federalizing everything. It's taking power away from local communities. It's taking power away from the states to enforce these blanket ideas. Well, we all come from different places. There's a very different vibe here in the Boston area than there is in rural Wisconsin where I come from. It's a very different thing living in Monterey, California than it is living in Bangor, Maine or, or Miami, Florida. This idea that one size fits all, right? One way of doing things. Uh, the same government that preaches diversity is destroying it. Destroying the differences that make our culture so unique and specific and vibrant. And most dangerously, this kind of federalized education is one size fits all education. We are going to make every kid the same kid. Think about what the word common and common core means. Raise your hands, moms and dads, if your child's common. Raise your hand if your kid is standard. See, your kids are made in the image of God, and that means that they all have different skills. Your kids have different gifts and talents. If we're going to make 60 million American school kids the same kid, know exactly the same thing, by definition, is that going to be a, a higher standard or a lower one? No. See, it has to be. And by the way, the objective is to not, not to allow your child to be good at math if she's good at math, or be a good writer if he's a good writer, or be an, a creative artist if that's what God called them to do. We're going to give all kids a low, very basic education in the name of fairness. That's not fair. Right? Let our kids become what they can become. And of course, the family and Christianity, Judeo-Christian values, are the two primary things that get in the way of this centralization. Matter of fact, how about the National Education Association? How about the largest teachers union in America? How about the most powerful union in America? The NEA spends more of its teachers' dues on political lobbying and activism than any other uh, union in this country. Go all the way back to 1947, after World War II. American boys went overseas, made the world quote-unquote safe for democracy. Then they came home and started going to college under the GI Bill. Their kids and families went to college. The NEA told you as early as 1947, after the war, what the purpose of modern education is. Quote, in 1947, far too many people in America, both in and out of education, look upon the elementary school as a place to learn reading, writing, and arithmetic. You actually think the purpose of schools is to teach your kids to read, to write, to think? No, it's not. Far too many of you believe the purpose of the schools is to teach your kids basic education. 1940, not 48, what are we doing? Education for international understanding, in other words, globalism. We must use the schools to break down nation states, to take a, it's not just we want all kids in America to be the same kid, we want every kid in the world learning the same thing in the same classroom, the same way every day. That's what's happening here. But they know before they can get the world on board, you have to break down this country and all of its offensive liberty and individuality, right? We've got to take that away. Education for international understanding involves the use of education 
as a force to condition the will of the people. The purpose of education is not to ABCs and 123s. The purpose of education is to change the way children think about their country, their world, the way they think about their faith and their religion and their families. Horace Mann, a hundred years before, exactly 100 years before the NEA said it, Horace Mann said it. We are going to use the schools to change culture. We're going to change the makeup of the country. We're going to, we're going to get rid of the Constitution. We're going to make students gl not global citizens dedicated to the state. And by the time you got to 1969, and we remember what happened in the universities between 1948 and 1969. They became radicalized, right? Politically radicalized. Here's the NEA in 1969. Schools will become clinics whose purpose is to provide individualized psychosocial treatment to the student. And teachers must become psychosocial therapists. Do you know under Common Core, your teachers are spending more time in the classroom monitoring behavior, monitoring attitudes, taking copious notes about your kids' opinions, behaviors. They're spending more time evaluating, trying to diagnose kids for ADHD and all sorts of things. Please explain to me what a teacher with a four-year college degree in education, what qualifies a teacher to be able to evaluate your kids? And yet in 1969, they told you, teachers are going to stop teaching. They have to, because the purpose isn't education. The purpose is all of this conditioning the will of the people, altering their perspective, making their loyalties governmental loyalties, not local loyalties. 1969. And then five years ago in 2011, people are asked all the time, why is there so much really adult sexuality in all the Common Core English classes? Why are they reading books? Kids as young as 6th and 7th uh, and grade, why are they reading books chock full of... Why are we now introducing things like transgenderism, mm -hmm. transgender bathrooms to 5, 6, 7-year-olds? Why are we pushing homosexual marriage in kindergarten now? This is why. This spokeswoman for the uh, NEA, 2011, Diane Schneider, here she testifying before the United Nations. That's the objective here, to get all of this a United Nations initiative. And here's what she said. There was a big long list, I, I, usually, I cut it out, I just put sex in a parentheses there, because there were a long list of very graphic sexual behaviors, uh, most of them homosexual, and what it said was all of these things need to be taught in education. The only way to combat heterosexism and gender conformity, so if you believe Marriage is between a man and a woman, you're a sexist. You're, you're bigoted against people. The only way to fight that, and the only way to fight gender conformity, that's the bigotry of believing there's such a thing as male and female. If you believe there are men and women, then you are a gender conformist. You are bigoted. The only way to fight this, she says, in the schools, is comprehensive sex education. Gender identity expression and sexual orientation are a spectrum and those opposed to homosexuality are stuck in a binary box that religion and family create. If you think eight-year-old boys who think they're girls shouldn't be allowed in girls' bathrooms, then it's religion and family that's doing it. What must we, she said to the UN, in our schools, what must we do to fight this? We must get rid of families and get rid of religions. And that's now why your five, six, seven-year-olds are getting bombarded with this. It's not because, and we know this, right? We don't talk about our six-year-olds about any kind of sexuality, any kind. Why? Because their little heads can't handle it. They don't understand it. You've been around little kids. Six-year-olds think abstractly. You tell a, a six-year-old the tooth fairy, she believes in the tooth fairy. <laughs> they don't know how to think about this stuff. How do you tell a six-year-old about a boy who thinks he's a girl who is actually biologically a boy? There's no way. When you're doing this to kids this young, you are brainwashing them, you are not teaching them, and that's what they're doing. How did Hitler get all those kids to betray their parents? He got them at five, six, and seven, and convinced them that their parents were doing wicked things. When you do this to little kids, you're programming them, which is exactly what they want, not just on an American level, but on a global level. Let me explain to you why Common Core is bad, and I'm gonna explain from the perspective of the Democrat Party of Washington State. 
Usually, whenever anybody criticizes Common Core, whenever ever anybody criticizes any big government movement, it's usually reduced to just nuttiness, right? Oh, you don't like Common Core because you're just a tinfoil hat wearing right winger. You don't like Obamacare because you want to see people die in the streets, mm. right? Any cr valid criticism you have is written off as kookery. Okay, I've stopped trying to fight Common Core on that because you can't win, right? <laughs> So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you why Common Core is bad, and I'm going to use all progressive left-wing sources. It's a weird country we live in. If you have a D before your name, you tell the truth, and if you don't, you don't. So let's look at the case against Common Core, primarily from the, per the perspective of liberalism. You want to give me eight hours? I'll make the conservative case against Common Core. You want to give me another eight hours? I'll make the Christian case against Common Core. Let's just let the Democrats do it, because we're supposed to take them seriously, right? Can't take anybody else seriously. The whole Washington Democrat State Party, the whole Democrat State Party of Washington has passed a resolution, legal resolution, condemning Common Core. Mm. And what they want, they want is to get the government out of all education, get, it out, get the federal government out of it. <coughs> and one of the reasons it's happening in Washington State is because that's where Bill Gates lives, of Microsoft. Wow. Bill Gates has spent about seven billion of his, of his own money to put Common Core in your schools. He's spent millions here in Boston mm -hmm. to put Common Core textbooks, Common Core pedagogy, Common Core laden computers right in your classrooms. And, and let me just ask, what exactly is Bill Gates' qualification to be changing American education? He has no educational background, he has no educational experience. Imagine if it were some other billionaire besides Bill Gates who had basically bought his way into the public schools, would we stay, wouldn't the Massachusetts, wouldn't the Boston newspapers, if the evil right-wing Koch brothers had spent $7 billion on Common Core, don't you think it would be on the front page of every Boston newspaper, yeah. right? Yeah. Why is it not? Because, because this guy is doing it for a progressive government, that's why. Mm -hmm. And so, let me tell you, so the, the Democrats of Washington State, in part because of what Bill Gates, their own city he lives there, do, is doing, right? They want out of it. Here's what it says. January of last year, the Central Committee of the Washington State Democrat Party has passed a resolution roundly condemning the Common Core standards. The very first time a statewide Democrat Party committee has taken a public position against the Core, and it happened in the backyard of the Gates Foundation, which has provided the funding that made the National Standards Project possible. This is big. If you want to run for party, Democrat Party office in Washington State, that's the platform. You have to sign on to it or you don't get any federal, any state money from the Democrats. It gets better. Here's the actual resolution. Whereas the copyrighted and therefore unchangeable common core state standards, that means your, the, the school, your school administrators have lied to you. They've told you that common core is just a set of standards mm -hmm. and teachers can get to it any way they want. Nonsense. It's copyrighted. The whole thing is copyrighted and tested. There's no way you can not do what they tell you. I don't know if any of you, you're all parents or grandparents. I don't know if any of you have ever been teachers. But the best teachers are the ones who know that sometimes the book doesn't work, the, the lesson plan doesn't work. As parents, you know this. Sometimes to teach your kids lessons, you have to throw away what you're doing and do something else. Mm -hmm. That's what makes good teaching. And now, under Common Core, there is none of that. Mm -hmm. Because the teachers are evaluated on these big national tests. Mm -hmm. Your teachers have no choice but to teach what there's, the kids are going to be tested on, even though it doesn't work. Your teachers now can't adapt. They can't throw away what's bad. They can't ignore it. Your teachers' jobs, their careers, their future depend on them conforming to this system. It's the same thing that's happening to doctors now, right? Doctors are limited in what they can do for you because the mandate. You have 27,000 pages of regulations. And if you as a doctor violate any of them, even if what you're allowed to do isn't helping, even if what you're allowed to do is hurting, you can't violate it because it's you who are going to get in trouble. Mm. Same thing now is happening in the classroom. <laughs> Whereas the copyright and therefore unchangeable Common Core State standards are a set of controversial top-down K-12 through academic standards. Lie number two, they told you the states did this. They told you Common Core was written by teachers. They told you the governors did it. No, the Democrats are right. It was written by a very small group of people and then forced into the states. No teachers had a hand in this. That's another problem. Well, by the way, if teachers wrote this, do you think they would have written something so anti-teacher? Nope. <laughs> that's, that's absurd, right? 
It is copyrighted, set of controversial top-down K-12 academic standards that were promulgated by wealthy private interest groups, Gates, comma, Bill, right, and others. <laughs> All of this, this will blow your mind, all of it was done without any research-based evidence that it's going to work. Your kids are guinea pigs. You, lie number three. You were told Common Core is better than what you have. No, it's not. Do you know that Massachusetts had the best educational standards in the whole country? That's right. Better than any other state. And you're, you're number one. And your former governor, Deval Patrick, friends with President Obama, yeah. he threw out those standards for $240 million mm -hmm. from the federal government yeah. and replaced them with these. Mm -hmm. With these standards, you had the best in the country. In fact, Massachusetts is the only state in the union that if you took Massachusetts out of the United States and put its school up against uh, the high achieving countries of the world, Massachusetts would have finished right in the top there. Mm -hmm. And that's all gone now. Your education system now is as bad as the rest of the country's. Congratulations. Was, and by the way, how long do you think it took the governor to, to spend $240 million? Not long. A few weeks. Oh. Gone, right? <laughs> but you still got the standards. So these standards were, not, were put in your schools without any single testing. Done. No testing, no benchmarks, no evidence that they're going to work. They were put into your schools. And they are developmentally inappropriate for children in the lowest grades. What do I mean by that? Well, I just gave you an example. Right. Common Core is full of sexuality lessons for little, little kids. Yeah. They can't process them. You've seen Common, have you seen Common Core math? Oh my God. Oh God. What Common Core math does? Little kids are concrete thinkers, they're not abstract thinkers. So when you tell a five-year-old that she has to take two plus two equals four and turn it into symbols, hmm. right, dashes and dots and lines and graphs, they can't do it. And the thing about Common Core is, math, is that the very lowest grades, when kids are just learning math, it asks kids to do things they cannot do. But with every year that goes by, the older the kids get, they're doing less and less math until you get to the point where by the time they reach college level age, they're two years behind where they should be. I'll prove that to you in a moment. For instance, in every high achieving country in the world, the countries that teach math really well to their kids, places like South Korea and Taiwan and Sweden, they start algebra for their kids, sixth or seventh grade or even sixth grade. Right now, we don't even start education of algebra until eighth grade, and under Common Core, algebra has been pushed into high school. So if your kids aren't getting algebra until ninth grade, they will never get to calculus by the time they're done with high school. They'll never be prepared for pre-med careers. They'll never be prepared for careers in engineering or architecture, or STEM careers generally, science, technology, engineering, and math. Our kids are two years by, actually, vis-a-vis -vis countries like Sweden and South Korea, we're now six years behind what the, our kids, when they graduate, are six years behind what foreign kids are learning. And why is Common Core math doing this? It go back to the word common in Common Core. We don't want highly educated kids. We want, this is social justice education. The argument is, is that not every kid is good at math. I wasn't. I got five useless college degrees. And I still can't add beyond 2 plus 2 equals 4. My life is okay. Right? Not all of us have the gift of math. Mm -hmm. And why not let create a math program where the really gifted math kids can do math at a high level, but see, then that's, that's considered socially unjust now. It's not fair that my son is good at math and your daughter's not. Mm -hmm. So what we're going to do is we're not going to help my, your daughter who's bad at math. We're going to pull my son who's good down. Because you know what? It's hard to make non-math kids math kids. It's really easy to hold back math kids that are good. That's what this is. Do you understand what the word common means? I asked you at the beginning, if your kids are common, let me know you're not. Some, your kids are going to do much better at some things than others. So if, flip it around. I, even though I'm a lousy math student, in second grade, third grade, I was reading at a high school level. Probably why I became an English professor. Because the one thing I knew how to do was read, to write. And when I was in third grade, I, could, I was reading big people books because I could. Nobody in my class was traumatized because I read. In the same way I wasn't traumatized because the kid sitting next to me was doing eighth grade math. But that's not fair anymore. We want an education system that everybody comes out the same. And you understand what I'm telling you? If you're going to get every person to be the same person, take all 320 million Americans. 
you're going to make them have exactly the same set of ideas. Are you going to have to lower overall ideas or higher them? You have to lower them, right? Mm -hmm. The more people you want to make the same, the lower you set the bar. And that, my friends, is the common in Common Core. Continue the resolution, the Common Core resolution. Whereas, how do they put it in, this, the federal government? Whereas, as a means of avoiding the U.S. Constitution's 10th Amendment prohibition against federal meddling in state education policy, it's illegal for the federal government, constitutionally illegal for the federal government to engage in national standards. It, and, and besides the Constitution, there are three different federal statutes from 1965, legally, that prohibit the federal government from establishing national standards or a national curriculum. They could not legally do it. That's why they let people like Bill Gates oversee it. What did we do with health care? We nationalized it, right? What are we doing with education? We're nationalizing it. Just a curious question for you. Do you really think bureaucrats in Washington, D.C. know better how to educate your kids than local teachers do? No. Local families do. No. But that's the system now. And look at what it costs you. Before, if there was something wrong with your school, you could talk to your teacher, your principal, your superintendent. Your property taxes were paying those teacher salaries. You had a say. Now, if you don't like what's going on in Boston schools, Boston can't help you. Mm. Massachusetts can't help you. You know the only one who can help you? Washington, D.C. Do you think, as a mom living in Boston, you have more influence over Washington than you do over your own backyard? But this is what happens to local control. This is what you lose. Now, if your school is a disaster, you've got to dial 1-800 Department of Education. How long do you think it is before somebody in Washington picks up the phone and answers your complaint? <laughs> when you go to your teachers now with a complaint, it's not my fault. Talk, talk to the higher-ups. And everybody tell them, that's not our fault at the superintendent level. It's not our fault. It's not our fault in the Massachusetts level. Because Washington, same, right? This is the problem with this. As a means of avoiding the U.S. Constitution, 10th Amendment prohibition against federal meddling in state education policy, two unaccountable private Washington lobbyist groups wrote the standards. They received millions and millions of dollars from people like Bill Gates to create Common Core, not the teachers, not the states. And whereas the U.S. Department of Education improperly pressured state legislatures into adopting Common Core and the high stake tests that go with it, and we're back to this again, right? The high stake, because how does the whole thing hang together? The testing. Your teachers can't teach anything but what's on the test. The people, whoever controls these tests at, in Washington controls your classrooms. That's what the Democrats are telling you. Whereas the U.S. Department of Education improperly pressured state legislatures into adopting Common Core and the tests as a condition of competing for federal race to the top dollars. So what the feds did is they bribed states. States like Mass. Devil Patrick got bribed. The federal government said, okay, remember in 2008 when the outgoing Republican President Bush and the incoming Democrat President Obama, both of them, said, unless you pay up billions of taxpayer funds to bail out banks and car companies, the system would collapse. Remember that? Yeah. Did you know billions and billions of that money was handed not to, to businesses, it was handed right back to the Department of Education, who began writing these tests. The tests existed before the standards did. So before you even had the educational standards or the curriculum, you already had the tests. And you know what that means, right? The test came first, which means everything else followed that model, right? That's how you assert absolute control. And that's what the Democrats are telling. This is Army Duncan. He is President Obama's education secretary for seven of the last eight years. He retired about uh, eight months ago. Uh, and he was, was the superintendent of Chicago schools, right, in Obama's backyard. He has no, tr no real education. None of his degrees are in education. Right? He's never been a classroom teacher. He was put in charge of Chicago schools for political reasons, and he was put in charge of the federal Department of Education for political re rules. In 2009, right when President Obama took over, the very, within two months of his inauguration, listen to Arne Duncan talk about his plan for American schools. I think our schools should be open 
12, 13, 14 hours a day. So it's not just length. So eight to eight or something like that. At home, we attached healthcare clinics to about two dozen of our schools. Where schools truly become the centers of the community, great things happen. And this is a chance to really create what I think the 21st century school has to look like. This needs to be the norm, not the exception. Time matters tremendously, and all of our families need our stores open longer. Is this a big ticket item in terms of financial resources? Uh, it, finances is a piece of this, and you, we again have significant financial resources, unprecedented financial resources coming to the table. Let me be clear this is thinking differently, being creative. So the centers of our communities need to not be churches, need not to be local family houses, need not to be local civic government. The center of our communities need to be our federal schools, our public federal government schools. Did you hear him say that we want those schools open 12, 13, 14 hours a day, 365 <laughs> days a, week, a year? We want them open all the time. Did you hear where he made a little a slip and called the schools stores? We're all ready feeding kids breakfast, lunch, and dinner on campuses now. In Green Bay, Wisconsin, they won a big federal grant. Here's the argument. If we don't feed kids three meals a day, they'll starve because you don't know how to feed your kids, Mom. But what happens then in summer when kids go home for summer break? Those kids are going to starve to death, right? So Green Bay, now the federal government is paying Green Bay and cities like Memphis, Tennessee, to offer breakfast, lunch, and dinner all summer long when the kids are out of school. And get this. Because it's not, this is all about being common, right? If only lower income kids are getting fed, that stigmatizes them. So the federal government says you have to offer this free food to all kids regardless of how much money they make. So if your dad makes $60 million a year, you still get free lunch. Because if that you don't, then the kid who, whose dad only makes $20,000 a year is going to feel bad. So now we're spending all this. In other words, do you see what's happening? They're already feeding your kids. And did you hear him also say, we are starting to build clinics on the public schools. We're going to give them things that you won't. We'll take care of their health care. By the way, under Obamacare, all that 27,000 pages nobody read, including the, the politicians, do you know a 13-year-old girl can go to her school and get radical birth control, including the morning after abortion pill, without even asking the parents? Do you know if a 14-year-old girl is pregnant? and goes to a school official. Mm -hmm. They can take her, provide an abortion yeah. for her, it will be completely covered by the health care law, mm -hmm. and you have no yeah. right as parents to know this. Mm -hmm. yeah. That's why they're building clinics. It looks awfully bad if a principal takes a little girl off campus to a Planned Parenthood site. Mm -hmm. If, however, it can all be done on site, wow. well, that's easier, right? Mm -hmm. You're, think about this. Your 12-year-old daughter shows up with a couple of Midol once a month on campus. She could literally get suspended for selling drugs. Yet they, she can, that same little girl can go to the principal's office and ask for hardcore birth control and it is handed over to her, no questions asked. This is what he's telling you. And now do you know why we started with people like Army Duncan, Horace Mann, and John Dewey? Do you see what he said? Do you remember what the NEA said in 1969? Our schools must become clinics. Our teachers, right? My suggestion to you is that this is not new. If you understand the history of who did this, you'll know that from the very beginning this is where they were headed. And how about Arnie Duncan right before he retired, just a year ago? Listen to what he said on the way out of office. The one idea I threw out that I uh, want to sort of road test it with the kids today is not this idea of public boarding schools. And that's a little bit of a you know, different idea or a controversial idea. The question is, do we have some children where there's not a mom, there's not a dad, there's not a grandma, there's just nobody home? And there are certain kids we should have 24-7. Okay, so listen to that. Do we really in this country have an epidemic no. of seven-year-olds living alone in brownstones <laughs> with nobody else there paying the electric bill or mowing them? But let's pretend, for the sake of argument, we do. Let's just pretend we do. Let's pretend there are all sorts of uh, pre-adolescent little kids running around in their own homes. Do you not have local organizations to handle that? Do you not have county, organ county welfare organizations? Don't you have state agencies? Aren't there all sorts of Christian outreach for that? No. What we need is federal boarding schools. Are there some children we should take from you and have them 24-7? And by the way, do you really think if they ever got them that they would limit it to kids living home alone? Oh, Mrs. Smith, you teach your kid 
a biblical version of sexuality. You're bullying that child. We have to take them, right? And remember what I said about status countries like the Nazis boarding your kids? The, the very Prussian system on which American education was based did exactly that, public boarding schools. We take your kids. We feed them. We provide them health care. We clothe them. We educate them. And it has nothing to do with what you want, right? And again, this is last year, people. Even he knows it's a controversial idea, right? Public boarding schools. Are there some kids we should have 24-7? <coughs> and that's Bill Gates, right? The man who paid for most of this. And you, one of the great lies you were told is that, like I said, that this is better than what you have, these are high standards, all our kids need to be doing this. Well, listen to what Bill Gates said back in 2012 about his own Common Core. It would be great if our education stuff worked, uh, but that we won't you know, know for probably a decade. It'd be great if our education worked, but we aren't even going to know if it's going to work for 10 years. So come back in 2020. Can you afford to wait until 2022? To find out if your kids' educations work? No. 2022. The number of lies you were told about this. To get, well, I mean, with all due respect, the whole you can keep your doctor thing, mm -hmm. the whole this is going to lower cost thing, I mean, it, it, this is not a Democrat, it's not a Republican issue. But whenever big government wants to do something that they know they shouldn't, they don't tell you. The, remember what John Gruber said? If we told you what it is, you wouldn't go along. So we just stop telling you what it is. In the same way, they want to cut you, mom and dad, out of your kid's life. Mm -hmm. They want to cut all of us out of how the country's run. Mm -hmm. That's the reality. How about more Bill Gates, right? How about this from 2009? The very year it all got started with this Common Core stuff. Listen to what he says here about who's in control. First of all, he's going to admit three months after the president was elected, he's already spending your stimulus dollars on the Department of Education. Nobody knew that. Go a little bit further, listen to this. We'll only know if this effort has succeeded when the curriculum and tests are aligned to these standards. We're only gonna know if Common Core works when the curriculum and the tests are aligned to the standards. Listen to that. You're told your teachers are free to teach what they want. How can it be when it's all lined up? And we won't know until that happens. All the lies, I won't stop at this time, it gets worse. We'll only know if this effort has succeeded when the curriculum and tests are aligned to these standards. Secretary Arne Duncan recently announced that $350 million of the stimulus package will be used to create just these kinds of tests. Next generation assessments aligned to the Common Core. When the tests are aligned to the Common Standards, the curriculum will line up as well. When the tests are aligned, then the curriculum all follows suit, right? $350 million in two months had already gone to the Department of Education to create just these kind of tests. There were no Common Core standards in 2009, March. There were tests. The tests, which were political, which were about control, which were about sociology, they were written. And then everything aligned to push that into your kid's classroom now. And do you notice what none of these people ever have anything to say anything about? high achievement, mastering literacy, becoming mathematically proficient. They never mention any of those things. What do we want? It's collectivism, right? They, they use buzzwords like equality and fairness. It's all just sociological garbage. That right there is David Coleman. He is the architect of Common Core. He's one of five people who wrote the standards. He was the chief person in charge of Common Core. By the way, no educational background. He's never taught a class, never had a course in education, never been a teacher, never been in a classroom as a professional. He's the guy they put in charge of the whole thing. In fact, I'll prove to you he had nothing to do with it. He has no experience. Here he is in 2011 being introduced to a group of people he is the boss of. And listen to how he's introduced. He has been involved in virtually every step of setting the national standards, and he doesn't have a single credential for it. He's never taught in an elementary school. I think. I actually don't know. Uh, he's uh, never edited scholarly journal, but I think he had written scholarly papers. Uh, and a variety of other things that, uh, you know, 
everybody here has done somehow, he hasn't done. You'd think someone with Lauren's experience would understand you never tell the truth when you're introducing someone. I actually think it's really important to try to base what I'm about to say to you on evidence I share with you rather than on the sands of my qualifications. So if I ask you or talk to you about doing something, it should be evident that it makes sense to you to do because I have no other authority. Because I have no other authority. So if I tell you to do something, do it. Because it makes sense. I have no authority. I have nothing I can do to you, right? And th this, I mean, this is amazing. You've got somebody here in charge of changing your kid's education who you've never heard of, who's never been elected to public office, which means if you don't like what he did, you have no way to get at him. None of the American people, the Congress can't get at him, the Senate can't get at him, he holds no political office. He was put in charge without any qualifications, except politics. This is what I call banana republic stuff. This is what goes on in third world dictatorships in South America. It's what's going on in Venezuela right now. People who have no control, we have no control over. Individuals who you and I have no ability to stop, we can't get at them, changing every aspect of American culture underneath your noses. This is government without representation. This is illegal, it is immoral, it, it, and it's going to spell the death of freedom in this country. Why are they doing this to your kids? And who are they? He's David Coleman. You want to know where, well, where President Obama, he, he worked on President Obama's social media campaign in 2008. He's the guy who put together all the Facebook and, and uh, Twitter stuff to help Obama gain office. Obama liked his work as a social media director, so he became in charge of education. <laughs> That's how it happened. You know what his real qualification is? Absolute loyalty to progressive ideology. Yeah. That's it. Yeah. Reliably, unquestionably loyal to pushing progressive agenda on our kids. That's what his loyalties are. Oh, it gets even better. Do you remember I said to you, let me, he's got his own organization, just like John Gruber. At least John Gruber does have some po public policy experience. This guy doesn't. He's got a little organization that's he, that because of his, his work with Common Core, he's made millions and millions of taxpayer dollars off of. Listen to him explain his own organization. So with that in mind, I'm about to jump in, but I'm just going to say one word about my own organization, which is Student Achievement Partners. Student Achievement Partners, all you need to know about us are a couple of things. One is we're composed of that collection of unqualified people who were involved in developing the common standards. We are that collection of unqualified people who wrote the stand. And yet you walk into any Massachusetts school right now tomorrow morning, Monday morning, and ask a principal, right, who wrote Common Core. They'll tell you teachers did. The states did. You got the guy who wrote it telling you that we are that collection of unqualified people who wrote your kids' educational standards. Now again, it makes sense. You ask, why is education so bad? Why is Common Core such a disaster? Because the people who wrote it weren't interested in your kids' education. In fact, if you have kids who have the misfortune of being smarter than other kids or more talented in certain areas, you have to pay that price. We're done trying to raise the lowest achieving kids up. That costs money, time, effort, and real education. <laughs> We're just going to pull the high achieving kids down. That's the 21st century view of social justice, right? And you know what's ironic about this? This, this is so corrupt. Kids of any race who are good at math or good at reading or good at history, doesn't matter now. You're not helping it. You're just pulling them arbitrarily down because whatever advantages God gave them, they're not fair. Everybody must be the same person. This, and you know what this is, right? This is 100% pure Marxist socialist ideology. You know in the old Soviet Union, didn't matter what job you did, everybody got the same thing. So what happened quickly? People realized, what was the benefit of working hard? Because if you work hard, what do you get? The same thing as the person who doesn't work hard, right? And so what happened? And you tell your kids, you go home and tell your kids, whatever you do, son, whatever you do, daughter, you're going to get the same grade everybody else grade gets. What have you done to them? This is the paradigm. It's, it's absolutely demoralizing. <coughs> it gets even better. As a 25-year teacher myself, I can tell you that this is the most bothersome aspect of this. This idea that your teachers are free to choose whatever they want. That's the big lie. 
that your teachers could teach anything. They're just a set of standards, Pesta. They're just a, just a set of guidelines that teachers can follow a thousand ways. You think that's true? Listen to him. Which is teachers will teach towards the test. There is no force strong enough on this earth to prevent that. There's no amount of hand waving. There's no amount of saying they teach the standards, not the test. We don't do that here. Whatever. There is no, from somebody who's never held public office, from somebody you've never heard of, for somebody you never voted for, from somebody who has no educational qualifications, he just told you there's no force on this planet that will prevent your teachers from teaching to my standard. <laughs> and you ask, who is he? He's the most powerful man in the world on education. And there's nothing you can do about him. And if you weren't sitting here today, you still wouldn't know who he is. There you go. So, so what can we do? I mean, we'll get to that at the end. I promise, yeah. You, we're, we're not, I'm not done outraging you yet. Okay. <laughs> before, I, before we can talk about, <laughs> before we can talk about what the answers are, you got to see how bad it is. Okay. All right, and so let's do that. And, I, and uh, we'll do, we will get there. How about this? You want to get really freaked out? Yes. Why is there so much sex? Remember, remember the, the uh, NEA spokesman talking to the United Nations about we need this kind of sex, that kind of sex, this kind of sex. You remember what she said? We need comprehensive sex ed. Do you know where this got born in the 1980s when, they were, when the American federal government said, what we need is abstinence education. We need to teach kids biology, but we also need to emphasize to them that the only safe sex was no sex and that abstaining from sex was healthy. Well, the progressives, as you might imagine, hated that. So in the late 1980s, they started working up something called comprehensive sex education. We're gonna go exactly the opposite way the progressive said. Not only will we teach all aspects of sex, including what rather deviant forms of sex, let's just say, right? Rather than teaching nothing, we're gonna teach everything. And we're gonna tell kids it's all okay, it's all good, it's all just a choice. And here's the result of that. This document, and you can find it online, this, is a federal, this document appeared in the year 2012, the very year Common Core was really finally installed in the schools. Notice the title of the document. These are the National Sexuality Education Standards. They're standards, which means they're going to be tested. They are national, which means ultimately who's in control of them? Feds. Notice the subtitle. This is core content. What do you think that means? This program was designed to align with Common Core. Let's face it, Common Core is in the school now. This. Common Core is the delivery system for this kind of education into your kids' classrooms. And notice, when do they start teaching your kids about sex? Okay. Five years old. And they don't just teach content. This is core content and the sexual skills yeah. your kids need. Yeah. Your kids need to know sexual skills. They need to know how to do this deviant act safely. They need to know exactly what to use to do that particular sex act. They, this is the content, this is the exact opposite of, and it makes sense. Progressives hate abstinence. They hate morality. They hate modesty and responsibility when it comes to behaviors like sex. This is a complete flip of that. We are going to laugh in the face of your abstinence, and we are going to sexualize your babies. Because think about it. Can you think of a better way to separate a parent from its family? Yeah. A child from its parents, I mean. Can you think of a better way to drive a wedge between mom and dad? Yeah. Mom and dad would look at their little babies and say, no, no, Sonny, no, you can't. We don't think about these things, right? You're too young to date. You're too young. Right? We're telling ninth graders they're too young to date. They're telling five-year-olds how to perform sex acts. Mm. But, there's a, but this isn't just about mainstreaming sex. It is one of the best ways. The, the, do you know the Soviets? The Soviet Union, they used to take kids off the farm, young boys and girls, and compel them to engage in sexual relationships in the state schools. They compelled them to do that as a way of demonstrating the falseness. Now, nothing happened to those kids, right? Put, they took a 15-year-old boy, 15-year-old girl off the farm, they brought them into the state schools, and they literally had them engage in sex acts in front of the classroom. Mm. And the lesson from the teacher was, no lightning, no thunder, no hell, no damnation. It's a lie, the Soviets said, that sexuality is immoral. It's a lie, and all of it, the whole purpose of this uh, it was true, and by the way, the Hitler youth did that. Hitler needed soldiers, right, as did Stalin. What's the benefit of bringing healthy, healthy, young 16-year-olds together? 
what was the consequence is more Healthy children, baby. right? More children to feed the state machine. Now, I'm not suggesting that's an aspect of this. I'm simply suggesting the similarities. And the purpose of this is to separate parents from kids, yeah. to take the moral, ethical authority from parents and their faith away from these kids, to libertinize them. Now, here, here's some of this. Notice, this, you turn to page six of this document online. This, it tells you, when the national sexuality standards were being put together, what did they consult? Well, look at the last one on the list. They consulted, in order to write themselves, the Common Core State Standards for English and Math. What does English, what does mathematics have to do with sex standards? You want to know what? Comprehensive sex means every subject, every day. Mm -hmm. If we only taught your kids sex for six weeks during health class, their sophomore year of high school, you'd opt your kid out of it. You wouldn't send them. And they know it. So what they've done is, there is no one place your kids learn sex ed. Math now has to include sexuality issues. English now has to include sexuality issues. Gym, art, history, social studies, chemistry, all of them now are learning how to incorporate sex. That's why we've pulled these math problems out of common core textbooks. Story problems that are highly sexualized. Why? Because you're using every aspect of the curriculum comprehensively Sex. Why in the world does sexuality curriculum consult common core English and math? Those are the delivery systems, right? Here are some of the standards. By the time your daughter is seven years old, by the time your daughter is in second grade, she will be able to identify different kinds of family structures, and she must show, demonstrate ways to show respect for different types of families. So you're going to teach a seven-year-old about heterosexual marriage, homosexual marriage, polygamous marriage, single families, single moms, gay couples who adopt, you're going to expose a seven-year-old to all those permutations, and then you're going to demand at age seven, she shows the teacher that she respects them all. Respect is not an academic category. Who gets to decide what respect is? If, I show, if my seven-year-old son shows up and says, respectively, sir, my mommy says marriage is between a man and a woman. Do you think that's going to be respect? That will be disrespect. In other words, you are not, and by the way, even if you think all of that's good, that kids should be at some point exposed to all of that, fine. But at age seven, age seven, and to get them to the standard at age seven, you got to start teaching them stuff at age five. Any seven-year-old who demonstrates her respect for anything in the classroom has been brainwashed any of this stuff, because the teacher decides what respect is. And the teacher doesn't get to decide because it's all scripted above her. If a kid doesn't respect them all equally, if the kid says that one is more important than another, the kid has the temerity to say uh, reproductive sex between a man and a woman is a higher order thing than other kinds of sex, that's being disrespectful. By the time they're seven, these are kids that are too young to be able to understand what's happening here. By the time your daughter's in seven, seven years old in second grade. She must describe differences in similarities in how boys may be expected to act, seven-year-old. In other words, oh there is no such thing as male and female. They're all just made up. This is the transgender agenda, right? Boys act like boys, not because they're male, but because society makes them that way. Right. Girls want to dress like princesses and ballerinas because of, you know, sexism. How does a seven-year-old describe difference and similarities and how boys and girls are expected. And look at the next one. At age seven, you're going to send your seven-year-old to the internet for a sex search. Provide examples of how friends, family, media, society, and culture influence the ways boys and girls think they should act. I'm a university professor. I wouldn't ask a, a, a stupid open-ended question like that to 24-year-olds. <laughs> Find, go to media, j ir without bothering to filter it, just go to media broadly to find out how we indoctrinate boys into thinking they're boys. And you're going to ask a seven-year-old to do that. By the time your son is 10, 10, by the end of fifth grade, he will, let me this one here, he must define sexual orientation as the romantic attraction, romantic attraction of an individual to someone of the same gender or someone of a different gender. And again, what I object to in this is that there is no other definition. 
You're, the kid is not thinking critically of anything. He's got to repeat it. And what happens if you don't? What happens if your definition is different? There is no way you're allowed to do that. And please explain to me, because we don't teach sex ed in fourth grade, please explain to me where they're going to learn this. In English class, in math class, in social studies class, in gym class. There's no other way. There is no mechanism to teach this kind of sex to elementary school kids. It has to become part of everything else they do, right? This is why they're doing this to your kids. And this is what they're emphasizing in your kids' classrooms now instead of genuine academic achievement. Because genuine academic achievement means Johnny and Susie aren't going to score the same way. Billy and Cindy won't have the same comprehension levels. And that makes individuals, and that makes differences, and that opens up gaps. We can't control that. We can't shape the will that what we can do, right? is give this kind of education and require these kind of responses. Your kids are, remember what Horace Mann said? Your kids are hostages to their ideology now. And that's just, scary. even, I would argue respectfully, even if you share their ideology, this should really bother you that they're doing this to young kids. How about the teachers? Just taken from the administrative part of the document. Instruction by qualified sex education teachers is essential for student achievement. Oh. So given that there are no sex ed teachers for five-year-olds, every one of your teachers, no matter whether they teach math or history or science, they have to become qualified to teach sex to kids in their, in their courses. Think about that. They must be qualified to be, to be a math teacher means now, not just that you know how to teach math to little kids, it means you must be able to teach sex through math to little kids. How about the next one? Students need opportunities to engage in cooperative and active learning strategies with regards to sexuality standards, which means they can't just learn it independently. They have to practice. Not necessarily sex, but the standards have to be cooperative, learning cooperatively and actively. So in other words, it's not enough for an embarrassed, a, a, a embarrassed, humiliated little six-year-old to sit there and blush about this, she has to participate in the classroom discussion of it. Or she has to be, participate with her six-year-old peers in discussions about sex. That has to happen. How about this? Sufficient time must be allocated in school for students to practice skills relating to sexuality education. How about this? Students need multiple opportunities and a variety of assessment strategies to determine their achievement of the sexuality education standards and performance. So you never hear words like achievement when it comes to math and English, reading and writing. When it comes to mastering sex standards, we are going to test their achievement levels. It is remarkable. That's Jason Zimba. Remember I told you David Coleman wrote the math standard? David Coleman wrote the Common Core standards with five people. That's the guy most responsible for Common Core math. The Common Core garbage math that subordinates math knowledge to math fairness is his idea. In this short video, he's going to admit that his math program, the one your kids are studying now in public schools, it will not prepare your kids for college math. It will not prepare your kids for STEM careers, science, technology, engineering, and math. Won't do it. In fact, you won't see her, but in this video, he's being interviewed by your own Sandra Stotsky. She's a, a, a Massachusetts activist who's fighting Common Core. In fact, she, Sandy, who lives over in Brookline, just right down the road from you guys. She's not uh, an activist, she's a researcher. Well, she's become an activist now. <laughs> I won't even talk. I'm going to tell you. Okay. So here's what happened Common Core, Common Core hired Sandy as the foremost expert on English language arts theory. How do you teach kids to read? They hired her Common Core to look at their English program. She looked at it and said, get rid of it. Yes, she did. She looked at it and said, that's where she's the researcher. Yeah, she looked at it and said, get rid of it. Get rid of it now, it's a disaster. They ignored her, they hired her and then they ignored her. That's right. That's so right. now, she's, she's become an activist, activist fighting this that's and she's right. been all over the country. She's interviewing this guy about his own math program. Listen to this. The definition of college readiness, I think it's a fair critique that it's a minimal definition of college readiness. For and some. Yes, Dr. Stotsky. I think it's a fair critique that my definition of college readiness is a minimal 
definition of college readiness? The definition of college readiness, I think it's a fair critique that it's a minimal definition of college readiness. For and some colleges. Well, for, for the colleges most kids go to, but not that most parents probably aspire, right? The, it's not for STEM, it's not for international That's true. It's not, it's not only not for STEM, it's also not for selective colleges. It's that, not only, he corrects her. No, ma'am, it's worse than that. <laughs> not only is my math not for colleges or for STEM careers, and again, you know how unimportant those things are, right? Science, technology, engineering, and math. Not only will my math program not prepare your kids for those subjects, it will not prepare them for college either. And he's gonna, he, he says selective colleges. So this is not gonna get, get your kid to a selective college. And then he's gonna give you the example of UC Berkeley. For instance, if your kid wants to go to UC Berkeley, he better have a pre-calculus. Pre You're not going to get that in my math program, but he ought to find it somewhere. But keep in mind that the word selective math, selective college, simply means any university that has a basic math requirement. They all do. So a selective college is any college with a math standard. They all have them. I won't stop at this time. Let's do that again. The definition of college readiness, I think it's a fair critique that it's a minimal definition of college readiness. For some colleges. Well, for, for the colleges most kids go to, but not that most parents probably aspire, right? The, it's not for STEM. It's not for international That's true. It's not, it's not only not for STEM, it's also not for selective colleges that, for example, UC Berkeley, even whether you're going to be an engineer or not, you better have pre-calculus right. to get but into UC Berkeley, right? we have to Berkeley, think of our right? engineering colleges. And that's, scientific that's true. I think the third pathway goes, goes a lot towards that. But your, your, your issue is really broader than that. Oh, yes. So I just wanted to make, make sure that we got that I'm out. I'm not just thinking of selective colleges. There's a much broader question here. That's right. It's, it's both, I think, um, in, in the sense of being clear about what this college readiness does and doesn't get you. And that's the big subject. Doesn't but not to call something college ready when it only applies to a certain kind of college and a certain lower level of mathematical expertise that won't buy you far on the international market in most major disciplines of technology, economics, business, and so on. All I can do is shake his head, that's right. And what the lower level, the lower kinds of colleges, Jason Zimba says that at best, at best, Common Core math might prepare some of your kids to begin a two-year technical college degree, not a four-year college degree. Then why are they doing it? I know. I know. You're getting angry, but we've already answered the question. You're still looking at this as if school's about education. Do you remember what John Dewey said? Far too many Americans think education is about ABCs and one, two, three. And this was how many years ago? If, and this tells you something. This was all done, and all of us, up until right now, this moment, all of us believed what? That what was going on in schools was primarily, but, you, but think about it. If indeed our schools have been committed to educating kids well, why have they done such a poor job of it for 50 years? Uh -huh. yes. See, there's, there's a disconnect, right? Yes. If we were committed to math and science and STEM careers, then we're doing a damn bad job of it. Yes. The only, and our teachers aren't stupid. The only argument can be is that that's not been our focus, and it's increasingly getting worse here. And you know who agreed with me about these tests? <laughs> that guy! <laughs> these standardized tests that run the whole system. You've got 60 million American kids taking the same test. Do you understand that that has no predictive value for the kids sitting in front of you? A teacher with 25 young kids in her class, this big test can tell her nothing meaningful about how to fix her kids. Teachers don't even get to see the questions. Teachers don't even get to see the exams. How is a test, how can a teacher use test results to help her kids when she can't see the results? She can't see the questions that were asked. And until he became president, he agreed with me. In 27, ironically, addressing the NEA, right? Here's what Obama said about the evilness of standardized tests. Don't tell us that the only way to teach a child is to spend too much of a year preparing him to fill out a few bubbles in a standardized test. We know that's not true. We know that's not true. <laughs> it has no value. Don't tell me, he says, in his best preacher indignant, right? Don't tell me that the best way to educate a child is to make him spend too much time filling out bubbles on a meaningless exam. We know that's not true. And one year to the day after that speech, that's exactly the system he imposed on all teachers. 
and those same NEA halfwits that are standing up and cheering this, yeah. no standardized test, now are 100% on board with his standardized really? test. You think about that for a second. Yeah. 2007 candidate Obama. He was, by, by the way, that, what happened to that guy? How many millions of Americans voted for that guy? You don't got that guy. You haven't had him since 2007. But keep in mind that I have told you repeatedly, and we've demonstrated, this is a, the Republicans are just as bad on this. But that's pretty tall. How bad are the standardized tests when left-wing liberal British guys who come over here to mock us, mock them? Listen to this short skit from John, uh, uh, what's his name? Um, John Oliver. About how bad the tests are for your kids. If standardized tests are bad for teachers and bad for kids, who exactly are they good for? Well, it turns out they're operated by companies like all these, and let's just focus on the largest one, Pearson. As of 2012, they had nearly 40% of the testing market, almost triple their nearest competitor. And if you've never heard of them, then congratulations. But just mention their name to any parent or teacher in a state they operate in, and you see what happens. A hypothetical girl could take Pearson tests from kindergarten through at least eighth grade, uh, but a test, by the way, that she studied for using Pearson curriculum and textbooks taught to her by teachers who were certified by their own Pearson test. If at some point she was tested for a learning disability, like ADHD, that's also a Pearson test. And if she eventually got sick of Pearson and dropped out, well, she'd have to take the GED, which is now, guess what? Also a Pearson test. Their track record is littered with complaints concerning technical glitches, slow grading, and even the contents of their tests. Take, take what happened in New York just a few years ago. Almost 30 different test questions have now been declared invalid because they're confusing or have outright errors. They'd already pulled six questions from an English exam related to a bizarre passage about a talking pineapple. Students had to answer questions about the story, which they say goes like this. A pineapple challenges a hare to a race. Other animals figure the fruit has a trick up its sleeve, but the hare wins and the animals eat the pineapple. It ends with the moral, pineapples don't have sleeves. I was really confused because uh, I expected a lot more from them. That article about the pineapple and the hair was stupid and absurd. So, and did you hear what she said? Did you hear what they said? That the students had to tell us what the question was. Because none of the reporters were allowed to see the test. So the students told them about the story. What kind of a system is it that you're giving tests to your kids? The teachers don't see, that the parents can't see. At the talk we gave last night, where was that? Wilbraham. In Wilbraham. Gave a talk last night in Wilbraham. We had school administrators there, school board members, who actually sued the state of Massachusetts to show the school board the quest test questions. I mean, how can we as a school board help our kids get better when we don't know what's on the test? The state of Massachusetts denied it and said, we do not do that. So no one in your state, and remember, you had the best standards and the most transparent tests in the whole country before they did this to you. Now you don't see anything. Talk about cutting you out, right? Not only are your standards garbage, now you don't even get to see what they're doing to your kids. It gets better, right? <laughs> who's, if teachers don't see the tests, that means teachers don't grade the tests. So who's grading your kids' tests? Does it surprise you <laughs> that they're taking out ads on Craigslist for $9 an hour to grade your kids' exams? Listen to this. The company posted this ad to Craigslist. It's to find people to grade the exams. We looked at an essay every two minutes, a short answer every five seconds, every 10 seconds. We don't understand your kids. We don't understand anyone's kids. I was told when I was beginning a project that last year, you know, there were a certain amount of twos, a certain amount of threes, a certain amount of fours. We expect that to be similar this year. If that's not similar, they will tell you, we're scoring too many threes. We're scoring too many fours. They'll say, you have to learn to see more papers as a three. You have to learn to see more papers as a four. Did you hear that first fellow said? $9 an hour to anybody who wants to make nine bucks an hour to grade your kid's examination. And did you hear that first fellow? I've, I've been a professor for 25 years. I can't grade an essay exam in two minutes. I can't grade a short answer in five seconds. And I've been doing it for 25 years. You're pulling people off the street for minimum wage and giving them two minutes to read the essay your kid, your kid starts to study to write for six months in school. Mm -hmm. And then you also find out from the other guy, the graders, like this guy, well, when we graded them, they didn't like it. They told us what we had to do. So in other words, 
Not only are they not graded and written by teachers, even when they are graded, the people in charge are manipulating the results. You're not grading this right, grade it this way. And that's why they don't have teachers grade them. If these idiots told teachers how to grade the exams, the teachers would say, you're not a teacher, leave me alone. So you don't have teachers do it. You have $9 an hour lackeys who don't know any better, <laughs> right? No offense to them, but that's what this is. Yeah. I mean, would you, you, need a, your, your, you need your appendix taken out. So w would you allow us to hire somebody for $9 an hour? Come and do that. And then when they made the incision on the wrong side of your abdomen, oh, you, you, you're not doing that right. This is insanity. Nine dollars an hour and still. You, or if I told the guy operating on your appendix, okay, for the very first time for nine bucks, and, and you got to do it in about a minute and a half, go for it. <laughs> this is exactly what's <laughs> happening here. In other words, the tests are utterly meaningless, but the tests are all you have. The tests are what's forcing every, and then I'll go back to this, right? Get out of park. Oh good, Massachusetts, you got out of park. But lo and behold, what they pick? MCAS 2.0, which is very, very much the same thing, but all the moms and dads who don't like park now don't know what, the mass, what this is, and so they think everything is fixed. Bingo, right? Oh, and what party is your governor? Republican. He's a Republican, isn't he? Yeah. Right? So there's a lot of blame to go along on this. All right, and let's just end with this. Your next president. Here she is. You ready for her? No. <laughs> In less than seven, one week, there's your president. And here's oh, no. what she said about education in April of 2015. Remember what I said about you as moms and dads being cut out of the process? Listen to what Hillary Clinton said on the campaign trail a year ago. You know, when I think about the really unfortunate argument that's been going on around Common Core, it's very painful. How do we end up at a point where we are so um, negative about the most important non-family enterprise in the raising of the next generation, which is how our kids are educated. The most important non-family ed, yeah, you see you're screaming, yeah. the most important non-family enterprise in the raising of the next generation is education. You already have no business in it. Wow. This is the same woman that 20 years ago at least said it took a village. <laughs> Not anymore. We'll cut the village out. No point. Uh, that's the, the best possible place to end this because this is what the stakes are, right? I mean, you're, they already don't think you belong in education. They're already not sending home homework with your kids. They're already not letting you see the kids' textbooks. The teachers themselves don't get to see the, quiz, the kids' tests. It's public school, which means it belongs to you. But you have no it. say in it. We pay for it. You pay for it. It belongs to you. It belongs to the teachers who are trained to do it. But none of you have any say over it. None of the teachers do. It's over there, right? So I'm done, but let me just start where you wanted me to go. Now that you see the outrage. And if you got four more hours, I'll, I'll piss you off some more. You want to keep going? No. But you want to know what you do about it. There's, after 500 talks in 46 states, after testifying before 22 different state legislatures, after writing numerous articles and journals and magazine pieces about the dangers of Common Core, I'll tell you what the deal is. Number one, get your kid out. That's right. Now I know, now I know that a lot of moms and dads can't afford it. They can't afford, this, and particularly in the inner cities, can't afford to send their kid to private schools. Can't afford to homeschool. Okay, if you can't do those things, can you spend an hour a night with your kid? When your kid comes home from school today, can you turn off the TV, put down the iPod, can you sit down with him for a second and say, okay, tell me what you learned about history in your classrooms. Tell me how your teacher taught you to do your math programs. And if, and they will, give you a completely screwy version of what happened in school, can you take an hour to show them the truth? Okay, I get it. This is, uh, th your teacher thinks America's a horrible country for those reasons, but let's look at these other reasons. Okay, here, they taught you to add this real complicated way. Let me just show you how to add this way, right? You, I don't care who you are, you can do that. We're in this problem, we have this problem, not because they did it to us, but because for over a hundred years, we decided that the government's the primary educators of our kids. I don't see it in the Bible, do you? Nope. The Bible makes it real clear that we are responsible for our kids' education. Common sense declares they're my babies, not strangers' babies. I should be responsible for their education. And the Constitution of the United States 
makes it clear that they are your babies. Yeah. We gave this away. And if you can't homeschool your kids, if you can't find a way to protect them, you can at least spend some time teaching them an alternative worldview. That is all you can do. Yeah, the election. We have Donald Trump, who has said repeatedly he'll get rid of Common Core. And I'm going to be very honest with you. I don't think he even really completely understands. What is, what is his training in education? The man's a businessman. I mean, he has no... I, I like that he says he's going to get rid of Common Core. I like that he says he's going to get rid of the Department of Education. I'll go right to you. I, you know, I like that. Still infinitely better than what she says. But I'm simply suggesting to you that presidents since the time of Ronald Reagan have said they're getting rid of the Department of Education. Mm -hmm. Have any of them? No. Nope. At one point, Bill Clinton said it. So you've had Democrats, Republicans, Democrat, Republicans, Democrat, Republicans for the last 40 years promising to do away with it, and they haven't. He says they'll do it. That's better than what you're going to get with her. My point is, is that if you, if you want to fix these schools, you have to start by getting rid of the Department of Education. That's you have right. an entire department at the national level whose job it is to control education. Right. All the money that goes out to the states comes to them first. They give it out. So why are, why are your Republicans not fighting this? Why is this so-called Republican governor lying to you when he's, he's going to fix it, he doesn't? Because there's too much money attached to this. And the only way you get rid of the money is to get rid of the Federal Department of Education. Look, if you get rid of the Department of Education, there will still be national money to help the states. It just won't be controlled by the Department of Education. You're better off there. But if we start, even if Donald Trump wins and starts the process of doing all of this, it's going to be 10, 20 years before all of this is out of your schools, if everybody agrees to do it, which they won't. But even if you start tomorrow, so what do you do? Here's my advice to you. Number one, take care of your kids and grandkids. Before you do anything else, before you worry about your state, before you worry about national elections, you make sure your kids and grandkids are getting something useful besides what they're getting in the public schools. That's your first moral responsibility. If you have done that, it will be reckoned unto you. However, once you do that, we all have different talents. Some of us speak, some of us write, some of us can just make phone calls. You pick once a week something to do. You, you try to help, a, you talk, talk to your sister's kids and your sister about this. You talk to your cousin, the neighbor down the street who you have coffee with, try to explain it to her. Make a phone call, vote, try to vote for candidates who are better about this than worse. Do what you can. Don't let this happen to you. This is a very discouraging thing. It's depressing. And if you, try to fix it all yourself or get discouraged because what you're doing isn't working or you don't think it's working, you're going to lose this battle. Mm -hmm. Your job is not to fix it. Your job is to push back against it. Do it. Try to influence people around you. We'll be, uh, I'm pretty sure we're going to be back here in the next couple of months. Uh, we, we, should, we got what? Eight people here? Nine people here? Take away the people who are the activists who brought me here. We got about six people here. I realize it's a Saturday. But this is a free lecture yeah. open to the public. And you don't think that the particular, uh, the inner city community where we're at now, you don't think that lower income families, you don't think that minority families are gonna get hammered by this worse? Mm -hmm. Rich white families can hire tutors. Rich black families can too for that matter, but you know what you're gonna get here? It's the worst of this. And yet, where are the moms and dads? Where are they? And it was true last night. Rich, wealthy, suburban suburb, we had 70 people. They did 10 times the amount of advertising you guys did for this, and they got 70 people. And you pull out the activists and the school board people, we had about 60 people. That's as embarrassing as this. And so it's not your fault, but you wanna know how to fix this? Look around you, that's the answer. You won't until parents make it a priority. So that's what you, and you can do that. Help the parents you know. When we come back this way again in the spring sometime, you, get, you make sure you bring three people to this. That's what you did, right? You heard me a couple years ago, a year and a half ago. And there's a bunch of people, there are people here now that wouldn't have been here if it weren't for you. And it may seem like a small crowd, but so what? This is the way you do it. Now, if everybody here pulls back three more people, this is three times bigger. It's sad. You got to keep doing it. But again, don't let yourself get discouraged because at every step, it seems we're losing. I know uh, um, in talking to you privately, and we had a nice prayer, obviously faith is important in this community. You gotta remember one thing, right? Our, our faith tells us that our job is not to win the battle, our job's to fight it. Mm -hmm. And that when he thinks we've pushed enough, he's gonna push with us. Yes, mm -hmm. And so keep pushing, right? If you take the argument that I'm pushing for him, 
then it doesn't matter how far you push. You just got to right. push. That's right. If you take that attitude, then he'll help. I mean, that's, what the, pro that's the great promise of Scripture. So you got to fulfill it. Uh, the one thing you can't do is stop pushing. A lot of people have stopped pushing. So push. Any other questions about this or thoughts? Yes. 